Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this roundtable discussion. We're diving deep into the ever-pertinent classic 1984 by George Orwell, a novel that has seen a remarkable resurgence in popularity in recent years. It's a pleasure to have such a distinguished panel with us. Let's start with brief introductions and your take on the novel's significance today. Amelia, would you begin? Thank you, Hal. It's quite incredible how Orwell's vision captures the zeitgeist, even decades later. It's as if 1984 is a mirror reflecting persistent concerns about governance, privacy, and truth. So true, Amelia. The book's notions on surveillance and cultural repression resonate deeply, especially considering today's technology and social media dynamics. I second that, Izzy. The novel's insights into human psychology and power structures feel incredibly prophetic when we think about our digital footprints today. It's fascinating, isn't it? Orwell might not have known about the internet, but he certainly understood the broader implications of a monitored society. Precisely, Mick. And we can't overlook the political aspect. 1984 offers a rather grim warning about the potent mix of media, information control, and state power. It's clear that 1984 remains a critical lens through which we view our world. Now let's delve deeper into the themes and how they continue to shape our modern discourse. If we can begin, let's broach the nature and manipulation of truth. The parameters seem shifted in modern society. What parallels can we draw between the altering of truth in 1984 and contemporary instances? I find historical comparisons quite stark. Take, for instance, the Ministry of Truth's role in 1984. We've seen regimes past and present manipulating information to control the narrative. In fact, today's technology aids this manipulation on a global scale. Yes, and the troubling aspect is the emergence of so-called alternative facts. The cognitive dissonance they create can't be understated. It changes how society perceives reality itself. Moral relativism plays into this too. If truth becomes fluid, it destabilizes the moral compass necessary for a unified societal judgment. Indeed, but isn't this more about how truths are received rather than just disseminated? Past societies may have been more skeptical. Now, with the deluge of information, it's harder for individuals to discern or even resist altered truths. And with this blurring of truth, we're seeing harmful societal consequences. It's fueling divisions, breeding distrust in institutions that once were considered stalwarts of factual information. Exactly. And while this might seem bleak, being aware of it is the first step in addressing the manipulation. But awareness alone isn't enough. We need active, critical engagement to push back against this tide. The psychological impact is profound and lasting. Insightful. We're essentially locked in a battle over the very nature of reality. True, Hal, and it's in this battle that fiction becomes a weapon, sharp and double-edged. Amelia, you've certainly hit the ground running. Appreciate it, Izzy. We're fighting against an erosion of foundational truths, and that's a fight that spans all cultural and historical contexts. Exactly, Amelia, though we must acknowledge that some battles are lost before they are even fought. The psychological impact, you can't underestimate that. To your point, Lenny, the receptivity of the public to these manipulated truths has evolved, hasn't it? Perhaps our understanding of truth itself must evolve. Somehow, we find ourselves back to the matter of moral relativism and the authority to determine what truth is or isn't. That's the key issue, isn't it? Once the line between truth and fiction is blurred, society's foundation begins to crumble. All I can add is we need to recognize and challenge the manipulation of truth whenever we encounter it. Our autonomy as individuals depends on it. And there's our impassioned foundation for discussion, a fertile ground indeed, for our deliberations to come. We've ushered ourselves into an era where the term privacy seems to be redefined by the minute. Let's dive into the parallel between Orwell's telescreens and today's digital surveillance. Jazz, what's your standpoint on modern technologies in comparison to the fiction of the past? It's an intriguing landscape, Hal. The telescreens in 1984 were a form of constant surveillance, instrumental in maintaining the party's power. 
Today, while smartphones and smart homes serve us convenience, they also collect data continuously. Inadvertently, we've accepted a level of surveillance that might have horrified Orwell. Jazz's point is solid. What stuns me is the cultural adaptation. It's as if the panopticon has been welcomed into the home. Yet the disparity is glaring when you consider these devices as luxuries for some and instruments of monitoring for marginalized communities. Digital privilege and surveillance aren't mutually exclusive. A. The surveillance capitalism Izzy mentions is rampant. Our personal data's become the new oil. It's a trade-off, isn't it? We've bought into this convenience at the expense of our privacy, a process most of us barely understand or question. Indeed, Lenny. The shift is global, however, let's not overlook that different cultures have wildly varying norms on what is considered private. Some societies have embraced these changes more readily, while others resist, making an international consensus on digital privacy even more complex. We're treading old ground, though. History shows us repeated examples where civilizations have accepted forms of surveillance. The difference now? The scale and the opacity of data processing. The individual's autonomy over private life is fragile. How we handle this is crucial. Fragile, it's a poignant way to put it. Technological advancements, while they open doors, can also be tools that dismantle our autonomy before we know it. That said, doesn't it boil down to awareness and choice? Surveillance tech isn't inherently malignant. It's about how these tools are wielded. Ah, choice, a fine word. But when the terms of service are longer than war and peace, what choice does the average Joe have? Cybersecurity isn't just a tech problem, it's a societal issue. We need a literate society to handle the tools we've created. It's the age-old dance of power using any means to remain in power. The means have just changed, with more subtlety, entrapping the very essence of what makes us social beings, our communication and our privacy. Correct, Mick. The challenge lies in balancing the benefits of our digital age with guarding the very freedoms that allow it to exist. It's a fine thread that we're all holding on to. The malleability of language is a cornerstone of Orwell's critique in 1984. It serves as a tool to limit freedom of thought and to control the population. Absolutely. And it's not only about reducing language's lexicon as Newspeak does, but about stripping language of its richness. The way art forms leverage language is threatened in this scheme. Restriction, sure, but it's grounded in history. The control of language isn't new. Authoritarian regimes have always feared the poet's pen and the revolutionary's speech. That's the terrifying part, isn't it? How historical methods find new life in the modern era. We've seen similar tactics employed globally, impacting not just one language, but cross-culturally. And today's digital brevity is an engineered simplicity. Think social media, the likes, the tweets. It's alarming how these platforms encourage a move away from complexity. We seem to be converging on the idea that simplicity can be weaponized. But can the richness of language truly be pared down without consequence? Of course not. Think of poetry, the subtlety in good prose. To reduce language is to clip the wings of creativity. Interruption here, but are we giving too much credit to the idea that language limits thought? Our cognitive abilities are robust enough to entertain complex concepts even with a limited vocabulary. Not sure I agree, Lenny. Language shapes thought, and as our vocabulary shrinks, so too does our capability for nuanced reasoning. Lenny's got a point, though. There's resilience in human thought. Yet, what we must guard against is complacency as we witness the simplification of language. Let's not ignore the role of media in all of this. Newspeak may be fiction, but the real-world headlines often mimic this phenomenon distilling complex events into digestible slogans. It's an intriguing blend of observations. Language, as both the vehicle and impediment to free thought, is certainly a dance on a very fine line. Let's dive into the workings of doublethink. Orwell conjured a term still chillingly relevant. As we witness political leaders contradict themselves almost routinely, one wonders, are we falling prey to a modern form of doublethink? Indeed, Orwell's foresight was remarkable, yet the concept runs deeper than just contradictory beliefs. 
It's about the acceptance of those contradictions by the public, the willful ignorance that allows it to perpetuate. Precisely, Lenny. And it's not merely a top-down imposition, but rather something we see individuals doing to themselves, a sort of cognitive dissonance where personal principles are set aside for the greater narrative supplied by political entities. Cognitive dissonance, that's the heart of it. This discomfort leads to a malleable public opinion that can be shaped and reshaped, fitting whatever the narrative requires at a given time. An interesting point, Jazz, and let's not forget the historical lineage of this phenomenon. Orwell wasn't creating from nothing. Doublethink is deeply human, a defense mechanism that's been exploited by leaders for centuries. Orwell draws on our astounding capacity for this self-deception. Yet are we saying that society is blindly walking this path, or can we identify a resistance to such mental conditioning? Blindly? Hardly. The very existence of discussions like ours is resistance. Doublethink thrives in silence, not discourse, though this resistance off feels like swimming against a powerful current. Still, resistance is not as widespread as needed. Rational discourse is being eroded by engineered language that simplifies complex problems into digestible sound bites. People echo these rather than engaging in true dialogue. That's a scathing observation, but it's important to note that cognitive dissonance doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's our media landscape that often facilitates or challenges it. Mick's earlier reference to history is crucial. The past shows us the power of doublethink, but also the eventual intellectual rebellion it incites. No? And speaking of intellectual rebellion, let's ensure that we also address the cultural artifacts that promote questioning and dialogue, literature, films, art. They challenge the status quo, the homogenized thought. Heated agreements all around. Culture indeed lays the groundwork for questioning. It both reflects and influences our perceptions of reality, and by extension, our susceptibility or resistance to concepts like doublethink. Which brings us full circle to the role of the individual and collective responsibility. Doublethink may be an ever-present danger, but awareness, our discussions, art, education, that's our shield and weapon. Well asserted, Amelia. This dance between the forces of doublethink and the pursuit of truth through collective awareness draws a high-stakes battleground, one we navigate daily. Shall we find our way out or remain trapped in this Orwellian maze? The psychology of totalitarianism is an intricate framework. 1984 presents it as a complex and nuanced form of governance that exploits human psychology to the fullest. Let's probe into what that looks like in both Orwell's creation and the real-world dictatorships we've observed historically, or even in modern times. I believe that at the heart of Orwell's depiction lies the basic human instinct for power. Totalitarian regimes amplify this desire, exploiting it to establish absolute control. Ironically, Modern science has illuminated the neurological basis of these behaviors, yet our societies continue to struggle against the rise of such oppressive powers. Power, yes, but moreover, it is the structures that sustain that power. Take the overarching party slogans in 1984. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. These oxymorons are no different than the doublespeak used by real-life autocrats to cement their rule. That's a spot-on connection, Mick. I also see how totalitarianism attempts to erase personal identities, replacing them with a singular mass identity. Art and individual expression are threats to such regimes because they represent diversity and potential dissent within the culture. Absolutely, the suppression of individuality is a signature of such regimes. Would you say there is a consistent methodology to how these totalitarian regimes have psychologically manipulated the masses? I'd venture that one consistent method is propaganda, designed to target the psyche. It's about crafting a narrative so pervasive that it becomes the foundation for national identity, co-opting the population into a sort of complicity with the regime. And they often do this through fear, don't they? Fear of the other, fear of the unknown, fear of the outside world. It's basic psychology, keep the populace in fear, and they will cling to whatever semblance of safety you provide, no matter how false it is. Lenny, it's the exploitation of fear that's a thread running through all despotic rule. 
Fear becomes a tool repurposed as glue for unity, unity against a common enemy, often ideological rather than physical. It's a twisted use of basic human survival mechanisms. Well, not just survival mechanisms, but also the innately human desire for a shared story, a collective belief system. It's in our DNA to gather around the tribal fire and share myths. 1984 shows that in the extreme, a shared myth can become a shared delusion enforced by the state. That's an astute observation. Orwell exposes totalitarianism as a multifaceted beast rooted in human nature yet manifested in political and social dogma. But let's be careful not to oversimplify the issue by attributing it only to the manipulations of those in power. The populace has a role too, doesn't it? There's a mutual relationship, however perverse, between the ruler and the ruled. Indeed, Izzy. Opinions diverge on whether that's out of complicity or complacency. In 1984, Winston initially succumbs to the totalitarian narrative, but eventually resists. It's reflective of the dissident undercurrents in oppressive societies, those who eventually push back against the indoctrination. True, but such resistance often results in dire consequences, as Orwell so grimly illustrates. And the sad reality is, in our world, these consequences deter the majority from considering dissent in the first place. It appears then, that totalitarianism is as much about human psychology as it is about political ideology. The shadows of this dynamic loom heavily over our global history and unfortunately, the modern landscape as well. The notion of perpetual war as a means of maintaining social order is a disconcerting parallel from Orwell's 1984 to our own history. Mick, how do you see this concept evolving from past to present? Well, Hal, the adage of divide ad impera or divide and rule is as old as empire. It's a method of control. Keep the populace concerned with external enemies and they'll be less likely to question their leaders. Orwell knew his history and projected it into his fiction with chilling effect. I must interject, Mick. Though your historical perspective is compelling, the modern context has the added complexity of the military-industrial complex you mentioned, Hal. It's not just social control, it's also massive profit and economic entrenchment that drives the warfare state. That's precisely it, Lenny. The feedback loop between fear, warfare and profit is a self-sustaining ecosystem in today's geopolitics. I want to highlight another dimension. The role of technology cannot be overstated here. Advances in warfare, from drones to cyber attacks, have transformed how we engage in conflicts. They have made Orwell's prediction of a state of constant war more subtle and, frankly, more palatable to the public. So are you suggesting, Jazz, that technology has sanitized the concept of perpetual war? In a way, yes. By removing the immediate human cost from the public eye, the true horror of war is obscured. And that obscurity is what numbs the public consciousness. Orwell could never have imagined the surreal nature of drone warfare, almost like a video game played from thousands of miles away. That's a solid point, Izzy. But let's not ignore the social functions of war that Hal mentioned. What does the state of perpetual war say about us as a society? It's a reflection of our insecurities, Mick. Societies rally under the banner of nationalism and the illusion of a common enemy to foster unity, and by implication, compliance. Compliance? Let's call it by its true name, indoctrination. The state uses the pretext of war to justify tightening its grip on freedom, and in doing so, sacrifices the very liberties it purports to defend. Precisely, Lenny. The paradox is blatant. We're fed the narrative of heroism and patriotism, while what essentially happens is a curtailment of personal freedoms. I appreciate the spirited exchange, and I can't help but think how the specter of war shapes our identity. It's almost as if war becomes a part of our cultural DNA, omnipresent, shaping the psyche of generations. How? To build on your point, it's not just cultural psych, but a warping of the moral compass. What's acceptable and justifiable during war times seeps into periods of peace, blurring ethical boundaries. Indeed, and let's not overlook the psychological impact this perpetual state has on the human mind. Constant fear and anxiety become the norm rather than the exception. We're touching on an ontological crisis here. If we define ourselves through the lens of conflict, what does that say about our future? That's the crux, isn't it? Perpetual war is not sustainable, and yet, 
breaking free from this cycle seems almost unattainable given our current trajectory. It's a Sisyphean task, truly, but not one we can afford to abandon if we're aiming for a world that aligns closer with Orwell's caution rather than his narrative. So, in exploring the omnipresence of propaganda in 1984, we can clearly see parallels in our modern media landscape. Izzy, could you start us off with your perspective, particularly on artistic expression? Well, Hal, Orwell was astute in predicting the weaponization of media. Propaganda isn't just misleading information, it's an assault on free thought. Take, for instance, the suppression of subversive art. It homogenizes culture and, by extension, thought. That's a crucial point, Izzy. I've seen this with global media outlets that push a singular narrative, often sidelining alternative voices, which... Isn't that almost reminiscent of the Ministry of Truth? Indeed, Amelia. Since ancient times, the powerful have harnessed stories to resonate and align the populace. The methods evolve, but the song remains, shall we say, eerily the same. What's frightening is how the delivery systems of today's propaganda have become so sophisticated. We are looking at algorithms, not people, deciding what information we consume. It's worrisomely insidious. There's a level of personalization in propaganda now, where our data is the paint on canvases we don't even realize we're holding. You're painting a rather bleak picture, Jazz. It's true that the mediums have changed, but how do we reckon with this reality ethically? Ethically, sure, but let's not forget actionably. There are organizations pushing back against these trends, raising awareness so that we aren't passively ingesting what's fed to us. Action is key, yes, but so is awareness. Recognizing the mechanisms at play empowers resistance. Propaganda's potency lies in its invisibility. Don't you all find it sobering, though, how readily people fall into the traps set by propaganda? Fear and simplicity make such an intoxicating mix. That intoxication, Mick, is by design. It plays on the brain's hardwiring, you know, the fight or flight response. Modern propaganda taps right into our basal evolutionary instincts. Yet, for all this talk, we shouldn't assume we're passive vessels. There's a dialogue here, an interplay between what's projected and how society chooses to interpret it. Absolutely, and this is where individual responsibility enters. Each of us has a role in critically analyzing the media we consume and fostering spaces for counter narratives. We mustn't underestimate our power to elevate underrepresented voices. Lenny, earlier you talked about algorithms. I'm curious, can this tool of the problem become part of the solution? Theoretically, yes. Algorithms can democratize access to information by presenting diverse viewpoints. But there's the perennial question of who controls them. A question that takes us back to Orwell, doesn't it? Control the medium and you control the message. It seems the challenge ahead is ensuring technology enhances rather than restricts our freedom. Today's technology has really brought us closer to the world Orwell envisioned, hasn't it? The conveniences of smartphones, smart homes, they're like modern telescreens in their own right. I'd have to agree, Hal. Our gadgets are a double-edged sword. We have access to an incredible wealth of information, but at what cost to our privacy? The parallels to the telescreen are hard to ignore. The data collection capabilities of today's tech are far beyond anything Orwell could have imagined. It's not just surveillance, it's the predictive nature of it. They know what we want before we do. But it's not just about prediction, Lenny. Internationally, there are different approaches, aren't there? Some countries are resisting this invasive tech more forcefully than others. Resistance is key, Amelia. And let's not gloss over the cultural shift. There's a seductive quality to convenience. We willingly invite these devices into our homes, our lives. That level of acceptance is something Orwell didn't predict. True, but Orwell did tap into a fundamental human trade-off. Privacy for security. We're not that different now, it's just privacy for convenience. Mick, spot on. And what's disturbing is how desensitized we've become to this trade-off. Our sense of privacy has been so eroded that we barely flinch anymore. Especially the younger generations, jazz. They have grown up in a world where sharing every facet of life online is the norm. Privacy concerns seem almost quaint to them. It's fascinating, though. Globally, there is some pushback. 
We've seen the European Union's GDPR come into play, countries attempting to safeguard their citizens' data. Ah, but Amelia, how effective has that pushback been in light of the insatiable appetite tech companies have for personal data? It's a step in the right direction, at least, Hal, showing that not everyone is willing to submit to this telescreen society without a fight. It's a balancing act, isn't it? I mean, I'm torn. I love the benefits of technology, but I'm also acutely aware of the Orwellian shadow it casts. And it's not just about the privacy of the individual, is it? There's the bigger picture, how this data is used to shape society, economy, even politics. That's the crux of it, Jazz. The information isn't just passive, it's active. It's used to influence and manipulate, not all that differently from the propaganda in Orwell's 1984. It's fascinating yet terrifying. We need to have these conversations to be aware and proactive to ensure technology serves us and not the other way around. Indeed, Amelia. This dialogue is just the beginning. The philosophical ramifications of our telescreen society are vast and require our continued scrutiny. The erosion of historical facts is not a modern phenomenon, but 1984 brings it into stark clarity. The party's control over the past is chillingly prescient. Mick, your thoughts on the sanitization of history? It's the victor who writes the history books, a truth as old as history itself. In 1984, the past is not a record to be studied, but a canvas to be painted. Today, we're looking at a revisionism that's less overt, but equally insidious. Agreed, it's a concerning echo when you see certain governments attempting to reshape narratives, instilling a singular, often glorified version of events into the collective consciousness. Digital records make it easier to alter or delete facts altogether. Museums, physical books, monuments, they have permanence. Digital is mutable, like Orwell's memory hole. Yes, Lenny, and that's not the only parallel. The power dynamics in the distortion of history Erasing contributions of marginalized groups, for example, is something we're still grappling with. I suspect the root lies in our neural architecture. Memory itself isn't static. It's constantly reconstructed. The phenomenon is not just societal, it's biological, which makes it that much more pervasive. But let's not forget, there's a difference between the fallibility of human memory and the deliberate manipulation by those in power. Indeed. Memory has always been fallible, which is why the tangible preservation of history is so vital. Amelia, from a multicultural perspective, how do different societies protect their narratives? Each culture has its guardians of memory, the oral traditions of Africa, the stele of ancient civilizations. Yet the forces of homogenization are powerful, and the dominant narrative often drowns out minority voices. Therein lies the paradox. The easier it becomes to record information, the easier it becomes to alter it. The sheer volume of data creates a fog through which it's difficult to discern what is factual. And let's not overlook the complexities like misinformation and deepfakes, feeding the erosion of trust in historical accuracy. Trust is crucial. Without it, any discussion about history becomes a debate with infinite regress. Nothing is universally accepted as truth. A poignant point, Izzy. It brings us back to Orwell's notion of control. If the past can be erased, the foundation upon which we build the future becomes unstable. Mick? History has always been a clash between what happened and what is said to have happened. 1984 simply extrapolates that to the extreme. It's a warning that's as relevant today as it was then, if not more. This sparks a necessary, albeit difficult, conversation about our own responsibilities. Jazz, your final thought? To echo Mick, it's incumbent upon us to act as stewards of history, ensuring that the digital age doesn't become an era of digital amnesia. As they say, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The threads of fear and nationalism are quite ancient, aren't they? They've long been tools for hurting the masses. No question, Hal. If you look back, the use of fear is as old as civilization. Consider the function of nationalism in the Roman Empire. It was about unity as much as it was about control. But Mick, the nationalism you speak of wasn't always negative. The sense of community, the us versus them, it can be galvanizing, uplifting even. It's the manipulation that twists it into a weapon. True, Izzy. 
The duality of nationalism is fascinating. It both unites and divides. In one context, it's the foundation of identity and solidarity. In another, it's xenophobia and aggression. But that balance is delicate, Amelia. When fear is thrown into the mix, nationalism is often no longer about pride. It becomes about survival. And that's when the trouble starts. Those in power have always understood the psychology of fear. It's instantaneous, it's visceral, and it bypasses the rational mind. Before you know it, you're caught in the tide. And let's not forget, the greatest fear is usually of the unknown, the different, the other. That's where nationalism can turn really dark. You make a poignant point, Mick. Fear of the other leads to horrible things. We've seen it time and time again, and it's always wrapped in the flag of security or purity. We also can't ignore that these tactics don't appear out of thin air. They're engineered, cultivated through propaganda and political rhetoric. The stage is set carefully. Indeed, and we have to recognize, as George Orwell did, the potent combination of fear and nationalism as social control mechanisms. These are not new ingredients in the cauldron of control. And technology just amplifies it. Social media echo chambers magnify the voice of nationalism and stoke the fires of fear, often unchecked. The science of it is quite clear. Fearful stimuli activate the amygdala. Once that happens, logical thought takes a back seat, making fear a potent tool for bypassing reason. Heated for sure, Lenny, but we can't lose sight of the cultural impact. Fear and nationalism, they don't just influence politics, they reshape the cultural landscape. Reshaping or regressing. Sometimes I wonder whether we learn from the past at all or if we're just spinning in circles. We would do well to avoid cynicism though. Recognizing patterns from the past can empower us to make more informed choices about the future. And those choices will define us. Let's never forget the shadows of 1984 grow longer whenever fear dictates our path. It's our collective task to keep the torch of reason well lit. With the roads we've traveled across Orwell's landscape, it's time we bring our round table to a close. Final reflections? I must say, Izzy, your insights into fear and nationalism were eye-opening. What strikes me is this notion of history as a living entity constantly rewritten. 1984 isn't just a cautionary tale. It's an active mirror reflecting our strategies around collective memory. Thank you, Amelia. And Mick, I admired your point on perpetual war in society. That's a stark reminder of our vulnerability to manipulation. Without a keen sense of history, we're at peril of repeating it, and 1984 urges us not to forget that lesson. Much appreciated, Izzy. Hal, your philosophical clarity commands respect. Orwell's nightmare encapsulates more than the tyranny of power. It underscores our individual responsibility to the truth. We've seen through Jazz's and Lenny's arguments how central that is in the digital age. The responsibility is ours collectively, Mick. Lenny, your analytic prowess cut through the fog. And your moral reflections, Hal, serve as a pivotal anchor in our discussion. Amelia, your cultural lens enriches our understanding of these concepts globally. It's foundational, given the universality of Orwell's themes. That means a great deal, Lenny. Though we clash at times, it's this dialectic that deepens our discourse. Jazz, your futurist take nimbly draws connections from 1984 to tomorrow. It elucidates paths we might tread, should we not heed Orwell's warning. Thanks, Amelia. And let's not forget how our skeptic Lenny often steers us back to a grounded technical perspective. It's evident that our discourse echoes the dynamic tensions within 1984, a confluence of art, science, politics, history. Indeed, and despite our heated debates, our shared pursuit of discerning the threads of truth in our reality remains unshakable. Conflict, after all, fuels progress. Our dissent echoes the eternal struggle against oppressive constructs, and how your guidance gives that struggle direction. I'm honored, Mick. This journey through Orwell's vision wouldn't be complete without each unique vantage point. 1984, through our lens, is a reminder, a beacon really, to remain vigilant in safeguarding the freedoms we value. It's this interdisciplinary approach that not only uncovers, but fortifies the bulwarks of our democracy against any encroaching shadows. Well said, Lenny. And as our discourse has highlighted, technology's double-edged sword hovers above us. Awareness is our shield, dialogue our weapon. 
a fitting image, Jazz. As we close, I extend heartfelt thanks to each of you for a stimulating intellectual exploration. Our dialogues today, much like the enduring relevance of 1984, confirm that wisdom lies not in any singular view, but in the rich tapestry of collective insight. Let us all carry forward this same inquisitive spirit until we convene once more. Thank you, panelists, and thank you all who delve into these pages and ideas with us.